Hello, and thank you for tuning in to Answers from the Lab, where we share Mayo Clinic knowledge and advancements on the state of testing and science from laboratory leaders and the people who are making it happen behind the scenes. I'm Dr. Bobby Pritt, Interim Chair of the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Today, we're joined by Dr. Matt Vinegar, the Director of the Clinical Virology Laboratory and the Vice Chair of Practice for the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology here at Mayo Clinic. He's with us today to talk about a very important topic that's been in the news, um, and that particularly is measles. So Dr. Vinegar, it's great to chat with you again. Uh, the last time you were on, you provided an update on respiratory viruses. Gee, that seemed just the other day. And then you also let us know that we had a new measles test available at Mayo Clinic through Mayo Clinic Laboratories. Well, now it seems like we might actually have an opportunity to use that test. And we're talking about measles with the new guidance that the CDC released. So maybe you could start by telling us a little bit about um, the new guidance that was provided by the CDC. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Dr. Pritt, for having me back on. So you're correct. The Centers for Disease Control recently issued an advisory uh, to those who might be traveling internationally, as well as to physicians and public health officials to be on the alert for measles virus. It's uh, a bit surprising, um, but also not surprising that we're here in 2023 talking about measles, uh, which is a vaccine preventable disease. Um, there are multiple popular travel destinations, including in Europe, one of those being London, England, that have experienced outbreaks of measles recently. Uh, what we've seen over the last decade or so is that vaccination rates worldwide uh, have been on the decline, and those vaccine rates have declined even more in an accelerated fashion over the pandemic. So that's led to the increased possibility of a measles resurgence. Mm -hmm. Here in the US, we've already seen 16 reported cases of measles in 2023. And if we look at the first six months of 2022, that number is up from only three cases in 22 and wow. uh, up until June of, of, of this year. So again, it's an alarming increase here in the US and worldwide. And so the CDC wanted to get guidance and and an advisory out there for people to be on the lookout. Well, that's important for us to keep in mind as we all start traveling again as well. Yeah. Make sure you're up on your vaccinations and, and think about measles. Well, let's uh, take a pause and go back to measles. And can you tell us what it is and remind us how serious measles can be? What are the symptoms of measles infection? Yeah, so many people today, especially uh, young adults and children, may think of measles uh, of, as a mild childhood illness that they've read about in textbooks or in stories. And, and measles can actually be quite severe. Now, in most cases, people might experience initially a runny nose, conjunctivitis or pink eye, a cough and a fever. And then about two to four days later, they'll develop a rash that usually begins as these flat red spots on the face and then spreads down to the neck and the torso and the arms and legs. Now, in some cases of measles, you can see complications occur. And those complications can include pneumonia, often a bacterial pneumonia, which is secondary to the measles uh, infection, encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain, and even death. And a little known fact about measles is that it still to this day kills about 130,000 people worldwide, most of those being young children less than the age of five. So it can be a very serious illness. And that's why public health officials and physicians are very worried about a potential resurgence of this disease. Well, it's important information. Is there treatment for measles? Yeah, unfortunately, there's no specific antiviral therapy uh, for measles. So if you have the infection, there's no pill or injection that a physician can give you to clear the measles virus uh, from your body. Uh, those who are infected will receive supportive care to control their symptoms. So if they have a fever, they'll be given fever-reducing medication 
important to maintain hydration. Now, if a young child is hospitalized with measles, they're usually given vitamin A, and that's because vitamin A deficiency can increase the incidence of severe cases of measles because vitamin A is a believed to um, bolster the, the immune response. And then also some children uh, who get hospitalized may be treated with antibiotics, not to treat the virus, but to treat a p potential bacterial pneumonia that could develop. So no specific treatment for measles other than supportive care and then some additional therapies to help avoid um, serious complications. Well, how do people get measles and how does it spread from person to person? Yeah, this is a, a fascinating virus. And also a little known fact is that measles is believed to be the most contagious infectious disease known to humans. Yeah. So it has an attack rate of over 90%. What does that mean? It means if you have a room of 100 people who haven't been vaccinated or exposed to measles, so they are what we call susceptible or non-immune, and you have one person enter that room who has a measles infection, at least 90 of those susceptible individuals will come down with measles. Uh, it is extremely contagious. It's spread in respiratory secretions. So when someone coughs or sneezes, the virus is present in these very small micro droplets, aerosols, that can be in air currents and stay in the air for prolonged periods of time. Uh, they can even, those micro particles can spread through in those air currents from one room to another, similar to what we talk about with tuberculosis. So because of that very high attack rate, extremely contagious. And so when you have susceptible individuals in a population, uh, measles will most likely find them if a, an infected individual enters into that population. Mm -hmm. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Now, um, one of the terms that our, our listeners may have heard of is the concept of herd immunity. So yeah. can you explain the concept of herd immunity and how it would help prevent us measles outbreaks? Yeah. So in the uh, 1950s, there were uh, estimated millions of cases of measles every year in the United States. Then in 1963, there was the first uh, version of a measles vaccine developed and an updated version of that in 1968. Following 1968, the vaccine rates against measles became very high because there was such a high community knowledge of the impact of measles. So everyone rushed out to, to be vaccinated. So in the 70s, 80s, 90s, the population in the US achieved a really high rate of vaccine derived immunity. And so you might have 98% of the population having antibodies or immunity against measles virus. And that created a situation, what we talk about it as herd immunity, in which the majority of a population is immune or has uh, some level of immunity against an infection. So even if you have an imported case of that virus or disease into that herd or that population, the existing immunity prevents that virus from spreading and causing an outbreak. So basically a population level immunity helps to protect maybe the few people who are still susceptible by preventing these large scale outbreaks. Now we talked about herd immunity with COVID-19. Unfortunately with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes that, it changes so frequently that the immunity waxes and wanes depending on exposures and updated vaccines. Measles is more consistent over time. We don't see it change as much. And that's why the vaccine tends to uh, last for much longer in terms of its period of immunity. Yeah, that makes sense. And I know we were all very hopeful for COVID-19 that we would achieve herd immunity, but yes. it just seemed to be that. It's good to know that we could obtain that through measles uh, vaccination. So I guess that leads to my next question then that everyone's probably wondering who's listening to this is how do, how do you protect yourself from measles um, and how do we prevent the spread of measles? 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. The best step that everyone can take is to get vaccinated. And there's a routine vaccination protocol here in the U.S. and in many countries in the world uh, where children receive uh, the vaccine at an early age. And that is highly effective in preventing infection and, and disease from measles. Uh, other steps that people can take, uh, good uh, hand hygiene, always important, co uh, covering your cough or sneeze, uh, and staying clear of people who might be sick. Um, and back to the CDC advisory that went out, if you're planning to travel to other parts of the world, especially areas where there might not be as high of vaccine rates, um, staying clear of those who appear to be ill, potentially wearing a mask if you're going into large congregated settings with large numbers of people, but by far and away, the best step you can take is to get vaccinated. Yeah, that's really sound advice. So with the CDC guidance, is there um, are there any specific travel restrictions or recommendations other than getting vaccinated? Currently, there's no travel restrictions that I'm aware of. Uh, the advisory that was uh, posted by CDC is just to raise the level of awareness of measles if uh, individuals are traveling internationally, but also to raise the awareness among physicians and public health official, officials that if uh, patients come in with a viral syndrome uh, and have traveled recently to have measles on the list, on the differential for things to watch out for, sure. uh, because measles can mimic other more common viral infections in the early stages. Uh, so it's it's not easy to uh, differentiate measles in the first few days from other um, viral infections like flu or, or uh, coronavirus infections. Yeah, it's probably good to remind everyone to think of this since it is a vaccine preventable disease. Numbers are going up, but a lot of providers probably are not thinking of measles in their differential. Absolutely. Well, you gave us a lot of really good information. Uh, where would health providers go if they wanted to learn more? Yeah, I think the, the best sites that I would refer people to are the CDC website. They have a, a whole page dedicated to measles, uh, background information on the disease, symptoms, how it's transmitted, uh, and areas in the world to, to watch out for in terms of outbreaks. Also, the World Health Organization website is a really good resource for uh, global data and information on, on measles. I, I also would mention that um, at Mayo Clinic Laboratories, we have uh, developed some tests to help diagnose measles infection. So last time I was on, we talked about uh, that we had recently launched a measles real-time PCR test. So if you have a patient who presents with measles-like symptoms, um, then you can collect a throat swab or you can collect a urine sample and send those in for the measles PCR test. That's a good diagnostic test for early acute phase disease. And then also there are serology tests that look for antibodies against the virus. And those are usually intended for determining whether someone has had ex prior exposure or generated an immune response following vaccination. They're typically not used to help diagnose acute illness. It's mainly that PCR test. Sure. That makes sense. Well, thank you, Dr. Benegar. As always, this is really great information for all of our listeners, and uh, we will keep an eye on this and hope that we don't con continue to see more cases, but I guess we'll be prepared if we do with all this information. Thanks again for joining us today. Yeah. Thanks for having me back on. Thank you so much for tuning in to Answers from the Lab. Be sure to subscribe to this podcast and don't forget to tune in every Thursday and every other Tuesday.